So welcome to our last speaker today, Ronald Real. I'm really happy that he made it out of bed and on time for this call because he's from the US West Coast. So it's insanely early in the morning there. And Hi. he's, yeah, there you are. Um, he's a professor of applied architectural and applied architectural researcher, an author, a design entrepreneur, a thought leader in the field of addi additive manufacturing, which most of us know as 3D printing and earth and architecture. The list of his projects and endeavors is so endless. When I read his CV, I thought, how am I gonna tell all of that? So I'll just limit myself to the project he'll talk about today. His book, Border Wall is Architecture, where he re-examines with the 650 miles of physical barrier between the US and the Mexican states is and what it could be. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, exactly four years ago today, I decided that I was going to focus my creative practice on making work that highlights what I felt were the problems with an incoming president who ran on a platform of creating walls that divide nations, cities, communities, and children from their families. But I wasn't sure if I could leverage art to bring truth to power. So I'm going to share with you two projects around the themes of unity and balance that sought to address that doubt. And I hope to show you that art and activism can be smuggled into the spaces where it typically doesn't reside and into the context where it is needed the most. And the first one's about unity. I don't know if you are aware, um, well, I'm sure you are aware that migrant children were being separated from their parents when detained at the US-Mexico border. Uh, because of this, there were massive protests in opposition to this atrocity. Because I was living far from the cities where these protests were taking place, I wanted to design a protest sign that anyone could download and print and use in these protests. Now, the sign that you see right now on your screen is a traffic sign, the last of which were removed just a couple of years ago. And I wanted to build upon this particular sign to make this protest sign because it's very iconic in, in the US. Um, and this sign has a very interesting story of activism, even though it is a sign of, of the California Highway Department. This sign was designed by a Native American graphic design working for the uh, Native American graphic designer working for the California Department of Transportation. And he was tasked with the job of designing a sign to warn motorists that migrants who were dropped off by human traffickers in the middle of the highway would might attempt to run across the road. And so it was meant to warn them to be careful that there were people running across the road. And he sort of smuggled in some really interesting uh, design features into the sign um, because as a Native American, he saw the plight of the migrant today as that of the Navajo uh, Native Americans during the long walk when they were forced from their lands. So he thought that maybe a little girl with, with ponytails would be someone that drivers empathized with the most, but he also used the silhouette of the civil rights leader Cesar Chavez as the head for the father. And I wanted to build upon the genius of this sign um, to speak to the atrocities of child separation at the border. So I made one simple move, which was to turn the family to face each other and change caution to reunite. That sign was shared on the internet and people began to download it and use it in protests. And I created larger signs thinking that I would then perhaps place these signs alongside the highway. Um, not, this is not a legal act, but I thought I would simply do it to let people know about, and to think about these atrocities. But I had the opportunity to bring this sign back to the highway in a way that I would have never imagined. It became part of the Four Freedoms Campaign, which is one of the largest art programs, public art programs in the United States that ever existed. And instead of a small sign along the highway, I was able to create an enormous billboard uh, seen by hundreds of thousands of motorists alongside the highway, in some way warning them of the atrocities that are taking place alongside the border. 
But as an open source piece of work, this sign began to be used in other ways as well. You can find this sign now at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine on 110th in Amsterdam in Manhattan, in New York City, uh, where it lives for the last two years. Um, and just everyday people are downloading the sign and installing them on signs throughout Los Angeles. And interestingly enough, this sign became the building facade for the Johnson Museum during an exhibition on immigration and art at the border. And so I found it really fascinating, this idea that you could smuggle in activism into the context where it usually did not exist. This was a very controversial uh, artwork because of the political dimension of the work and because of the message that it was, was saying. And so this idea of smuggling in activisms um, and smuggling in art into these places uh, is the segue to the next project, which is about equality. And I was doing many projects along the US-Mexico border, and this is why I became very aware of the atrocities that not only included child separation, but the construction of a wall that divides the two countries from each other. And currently in place, there are approximately 800 miles of this wall built at a cost of $49 billion to complete this project and maintain it over the next 25 years. During this time, I began to illustrate the problems with this wall. And one drawing that uh, my studio created was a drawing where we imagined the border as a literal fulcrum between the relationships uh, of the relationships between the United States and Mexico, thinking about labor balances, trade balances, uh, friendships that occur at that border that are divided by the wall. And we also made small architectural models of this um, hypothetical scenario that spoke to the metaphor of these relationships. As the years passed, and this was in 2009 that we created these drawings and models, so many people were asking us if this was a real project, if this was a real proposal. And so we begin to make proposals to the United States Border Patrol if we could actually execute this project in an event that brought people together. And their answer was always no. But we wondered if perhaps we could smuggle art to the border that brought people together. And we decided that we would simply see what it meant to build these seesaws, these teeter-totters as we call them, as a project. And we wanted them to exist in the world. We didn't have the idea that we would really install them on the wall because there were lots of uh, legal implications around that and we were never given permission to do so, but we designed one that could be brought to the wall, inserted through the slats, made of the same material, and the seats could, and the handles could be installed uh, by people on both sides. And we, we designed and built and constructed that with a team from people uh, in a welding shop in Juarez, Mexico. We also thought, how can we smuggle in uh, this art to the border itself. Now, here you see the border wall, and here you see the previous markers of the division between the United States and Mexico, which are these monuments. Half of this monument is in Mexico, and the other half is in the United States. And you can see, actually, that the wall sits about one meter into the United States. So if you're standing against the wall where those footprints are, you are standing in the United States, even though uh, you are walled off from that country. But if you look closely, here becomes the literal fulcrum between the relationships between people in the United States and the people in Mexico that we installed on the wall itself, anticipating supporting the systems of balance that we would later put in place. As the news of child separation at the border continued, as the leader of this regime continued to announce the construction of more wall, we simply decided one day that we would wake up invite friends and community members from the families living on both sides of this wall to join in an event coming together. We finished the project, making it playful, uh, and making it inviting for children, but we painted the teeter-totters pink because we wanted to remember that while we were using play as an act of protest, we needed to remember that this was also a site of violence. And in the city of Juarez, 
pink is often used to remember the women who died during the time of violence, the femicides they call them, in Juarez during the 1990s. And so we came to the wall that day, and I'll let you watch a while because this is what happened. That day, this space along the wall no longer became a space of division, but it became a space of unity, a space of coming together. It became a space where mothers and their children defined the space. And so when, even when soldiers from Mexico came to ask what we were doing, they stood their ground and they allowed the event to continue to take place. And even when police from the United States arrived, and asked what we were doing, they too stood their ground and allowed the power of the sanctuary created by the women and children in this landscape to continue. So can we leverage art to bring truth to power? I'm reminded by the quote by the Greek mathematician Archimedes who once said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I can change the world. And for 40 minutes, we're able to show the world that play can be an act of resistance and that the actions that take place on one side have a direct consequence on the other side using only a lever. Thank you very much. Thank you.